further to that, uh, I mean, I think the chemical properties and physics of it all is quite relevant. Um, you can you can bottle up uh, a liter of fuel and transport it and keep it for a long time, but you can't uh, bottle up a kilowatt hour of electricity that doesn't travel very well. You can send it down a long line, but the line losses occur. So that quality of that of that electricity, you have to jam a lot more electrons along a high voltage direct current line to get it to where it needs to go. So that's another comparative. That's uh, comparing um, uh, fossil fuels and electricities. It is difficult. I think that in terms of energy use, it's what you're using your energy for, which is very important. And there's there's no one one source that it's, it's not you know all coal or all electricity. I think that uh, you, you obviously want to be as cost effective as possible and hydro is very cheap in Manitoba relative to much of the rest of the world. And so I think that that's part of the reason it's, it's used here. I, I have an electric furnace at home as well. It's not as cheap as natural gas might be, but um, you know I can make up some of that difference with high, fi high efficiency windows. One po point on coal and, and the comment about Alberta, and I mean China's a huge user of coal as well, the regulations are in place, however, that those coal plants, there's only one coal plant in the entire country that's planned to be built right now. Every other coal plant, there's no other coal plant to be built, there's natural gas plant to be built, and there's uh, hydro, obviously, here in Manitoba that, that's on, on scale to be built. But there's only one coal plant in the entire country that's planned to be built, and coal plants typically, uh, well, now have a legislative end, of, legis legislated end of life between 45 and 50 years. So within 50 years, there will be no coal left in Canada. That, and that's just due to regulation. I just want to mention, um, and I have great respect, like you guys are doing work to try and get people to reduce energy consumption. So I appreciate the perspective you're coming from. But uh, there is actually, Hydro has built a camp at the site of Konawapa. I've been there. They've sunk millions of dollars into it. So I know the NFAT process ended up recommending against Kahnawapa. The government has uh, you know, supported that recommendation. But um, uh, I've been in this business long enough to know that that's not the end of the story. Kana, you'll be seeing Kahnawapa in the newspapers. There is a there's a site there. They've put you know poles with lights for you know uh, people to walk between the trail. They've they've dug a huge uh, reservoir. Uh, uh, there's a there's a multi million dollar construction site that is physically at the site of where the Kahnawapa Dam is going to be built. And of course the Kiosk Dam is going ahead full blast. And uh, they wouldn't let me see the construction site there that was already built. So Conowapa was at a state when I should actually drive through the construction zone and look at everything. I have photographs of it, so believe me, it's real. Um, uh, uh, kiosk, I don't have pictures of it because they wouldn't let me take it, but it's going ahead. I passed, you know, huge amounts of equipment going up. Uh, I should say that, you know, the community of Split Lake had a blockade on Provincial Road 280 last summer that you may not know about because they were so upset with the fact that the equipment coming up was tearing up the roads. Right now, the, the Genpeg Dam is being occupied by the community of Penichikamak, and very recently, for the second time, I, for you who are concerned about democracy, you know, how democracy works here is we take an agreement like a compensation package to Saugeen last summer, the community rejects it. So what, what do you do with that? Well, you take the same agreement back to them. We took the same agreement back to them in October. The community rejected it again. I've said somewhere we live in a no, 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 yes regime. We'll take the same agreement back to the community. Every no is provisional. Every yes is permanent. Once they vote yes to that agreement, there will be no more votes. But as long as they keep voting no, we'll just bring it back to them every six months until finally they think that whatever they're being offered, $200 million is enough. And one of the things that, when it comes to First Nations communities, I suggest we start looking at is a number that has a percentage sign on the end of it. Rather than any number, any number looks big, for it, particularly for a small, remote Aboriginal community. But if it's not an ongoing revenue uh, stream of some sort, then I would say there's a, there's a genuine injustice being built into what we're doing. And so look for the percentage figure when you're looking at an agreement.
Uh, actually, the uh, comparing the Hoover Dam to the geography of the north in Manitoba is like comparing the prairies to the mountains. Okay? I mean, we know where the prairies are and we know where the mountains are. And uh, the Hoover Dam uh, has a fed by mountains in Colorado, or, you know, and it's just, you know, the water keeps coming until maybe those ice caps melt uh, and a few other things. Uh, in Manitoba, the water, uh, you know, comes off, you know, it takes a long time to come from one spot to another spot. Uh, when you have, you have to have reservoirs. The bigger the reservoirs are, the more they evaporate. So you're transporting, uh, the, you know, and if, uh, 30%, 50% with Lake Winnipeg regulation, maybe more of the water, you know, ends up evaporating along the way. So there are all of these kinds of complexities uh, related to that. And, uh, and so that makes the economics of it quite a bit, quite a bit different. And so it's much easier to build a Hoover Dam. It probably didn't cost much <laughs> uh, compared to uh, to what is done in the north. So. Just, I'll just add, you know, I think you're right, and I appreciate the fact that the Wasquatam uh, agreement, they negotiated uh, uh, a smaller reservoir than was originally planned. The same thing happened with South Indian Lake. Originally, they wanted to flood it to 10 meters, uh, and eventually they, you know, reduced that to about 3 meters, which still involved community relocation. And in fact, they violated their license, so they have to get special permission every year since then to, to manage the water levels on South Indian Lake the way they actually manage them, which is not something we know about. Um, the kiosk footprint, I think, will be substantially larger than the Wiswatam uh, footprint. The project is substantially larger. And I should say that the kiosk rapids is the last natural spawning ground of an endangered species of sturgeon. And so the biologists who work for hydro have said, oh, there'll be more sturgeon in the river through our you know, breeding program than there were before the dam is built, which kind of it's unproven technology that they can actually reintroduce sturgeon into the wild. So, you know, an endangered species is nice. What, what cost do you want to put on that if the sturgeon don't return, if the biologists for hydro have been, as some would think, wildly optimistic? Like, there's a, there's a cost for us to think about. Well, that's a great question. I mean, um, a, a fellow smarter than myself is actually uh, just um, wrapping up a, uh, an assessment of that. Uh, what we've done in the past, uh, I guess, couple of years, uh, you may have heard of this thing called the Canadian Energy Strategy. And it was, um, uh, uh, I guess, a desire to collaborate more closely across jurisdictions. And uh, there were a number of, I think, 10 different working areas. And one of them was this idea of sharing energy, horizontally, as opposed to vertically. And um, I don't, unfortunately, have the answer that you're going to want. But uh, from what I understand of that is that the system as it is in um, Canada, that each province holds, uh, is, is accountable for its own energy uh, transmission system, right? Manitoba, within Manitoba's boundaries, Manitoba Hydro, and, the government own the transmission lines, and same with Saskatchewan and Alberta. Um, Alberta has a different market system which doesn't allow for firm power prices. Okay, We need those firm power prices for us to ensure that we get the cost benefit for building another transmission line because the transmission service in Saskatchewan is not sufficient to transfer all the way. So it is essentially a capital project, a capital problem to build the line, to get the governments on board, and to actually change market rules, which at present is, is a bridge too far. Uh, there's one other aspect of that, and that is that uh, at the border between Saskatchewan and Alberta, uh, if you go west, uh, Alberta can uh, exchange uh, electricity with uh, British Columbia, and Manitoba has uh, at times exported to 
so some amounts of electricity to Saskatchewan and so on. The problem at the border of Alberta and Saskatchewan is that uh, the two systems are not compatible. The only way you can get electricity across the Alberta-Saskatchewan border is by some kind of a, a, a direct current uh, conversion system because there's some kind of phasing, electrical phasing difference between the systems west in Alberta and British Columbia vis-a-vis -vis the other ways. So. Yeah, and what I, I should have added actually is we do have small amounts of power going into Saskatchewan and into Ontario. Um, they are small amounts of power, mind you. But we do have, yeah, I think, four, yeah. four interconnections uh, on the west side and I think four on the, uh, on, the, on the east side as well. So there is a small amount of capacity, but it's just a matter of getting those other factors uh, addressed before you can go bigger. Just really quickly, the other thing is capital cost. And, and you look at this map, it's a north-south map. And those linkages go north south and they've been built and I mean we're building a, a bipole line right now that's well over going to be well over a billion dollars and so from our perspective we look at it more as kind of how can we reduce emissions on a continental level and uh, the most uh, cost effective way to do that is to offset in the United States just because that's the way the current lines run. Well, I guess I should start. Um, <clears throat> energy efficiency is, if you remember that first slide, that was the energy that we don't use. And as a result of the NFAT process we talked about, when we were, um, I guess we're talking about uh, Hydro's preferred development plan, it came up that uh, energy efficiency has a value more than just an export uh, revenue stream for Manitoba. It also has a value of uh, offsetting generation. And in terms of the, um, the evaluation in that in terms of that, uh, that process, it was found that it wasn't perhaps enough. So the government has, uh, has announced in the throne speech, as, as uh, Sean has said, um, that an, a separate agency would be, uh, would be created that would uh, address energy efficiency. Uh, I'm not privy to what that's going to include, but I understand it is, uh, it is going to, um, to, to look at the Power Smart program that the Hydro has in and find a way to, uh, to, to bring more independence and autonomy to that, that exercise in Manitoba. So really maximizing energy efficiency. I've talked to you about those three systems. This is, would be the fourth, the fourth system. The, the other thing about energy efficiency is it has some of the highest social benefits when you talk about energy. When you talk about carbon pricing, there's a risk, for example, that an energy utility can just pass that price along to uh, the ratepayer. And often it's the ratepayers who have the, the highest social challenges have the least efficient energy systems. They're renting from, they're renting, or you have homes that have uh, poor energy efficiency, older homes without new upgrades. And so the, the, the biggest, one of the biggest benefits from our perspective of energy efficiency is it, the benefits are felt by the ratepayer directly. And uh, it certainly uh, saves them costs over the long term. It's kind of ironic. I mean, I, I know of First Nations that are working on geothermal and other quite creative uh, uh, you know, responses to their own relatively small, but, but they're going to be there for a long time, so uh, 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 long-term uh, energy demands. Um, in the northern communities, I have two stories that I can't resist telling you. One is the prefabricated houses they built to replace, they paid people, I think a thousand dollars to burn their houses down when they were going to flood South Indian Lake, and they, you know, offered them these new prefabricated houses. The prefabricated houses were shipped up on flatbeds. The road was very bumpy, so the insulation in the walls settled about a foot to eighteen inches. Of course, the heat in the houses goes up and goes out to the area where there's no insulation whatsoever. So people were paying and are paying like a thousand, two thousand dollar a month bills. So the communities, you know, that are being most devastated by hydro development often themselves have those very poor quality you know houses uh, that they're they're paying extraordinary I've seen people with a twelve thousand dollar hydro bill you know they're paying these hor these like horrifying costs uh, when I when I spoke to Manitoba Hydro at the Clean Environment Commission hearing process I asked them about repurposing the construction camps they're spending these millions of dollars on like is there any way that you could design those so that they could then be repurposed after you use them as a construction camp for the local communities all of which are desperate 
like desperate for housing. And uh, Hydro's response to me was that mobile modular units are still the most cost-effective means of providing housing to northern indigenous peoples. Now, they don't provide mobile modular units to their own employees. They build lovely suburban neighborhoods for their own employees. But apparently, mobile modular units is now a phrase that sounds to me like clean and green hydropower. It's an Orwellian expression that basically is saying the long-term future of northern indigenous peoples is poorly insulated trailers, and they can just keep paying the hydro bills indefinitely. That's what sparked the occupation of the Genpeg Dam by Pema Chikamek, was people's hydro getting cut off in their houses and people not being able to pay their bills at the same time as they're seeing massive profits generated by the Southern Waste Utility. Well, one of the things, uh, one of the systems is a feed-in tariff where you know, if you do your local generation, you can feed into the system. Ontario has done this. Unfortunately, they were paying rates that were way too high, and so the public kind of turned on it a little bit. But that, that's one way to be able to do it, is essentially, uh, another, another is um, you know, kind of what we've done with geothermal here in Manitoba with the loan program to help offset capital costs. So on one hand, you, you can have loan program, low interest loans or grants to offset upfront capital costs. On the other hand, you can create systems where people can feed into the grid. And you can have either uh, net zero or net negative metering where uh, you can, if say you have a solar panel on your roof, but you keep your natural gas hookup. Well, if you get enough solar energy, you can reduce your bill down to zero. In other places, if you get, if you generate enough energy, you actually feed back. And it's almost like your, your electricity meter starts running backwards. And so those are two prominent systems, either offsetting the upfront cost or uh, looking to allow people to feed into the grid to uh, get an economic benefit. And I'd say, I don't know how we get there, but I think it's a good idea. We have, well, the geothermal, uh, the, the geothermal system is in Winnipeg. The, the, we don't have a feed-in tariff in Winnipeg. Ontario has a feed-in tariff. We do have that meter. Yes, yes, we do. I'm going to end it there. No, not because I don't have one. I'm going to end it there. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Please join me in thanking our guests. Kept the questions going for another half hour, but we uh, promised them that we'll try to get out there by 8.30. That's just about 8.30. So I invite you, if you have any specific questions, feel free, if our panelists don't run out the door, take one of them and ask them questions. And uh, there's cookies, coffee, and tea. What's left? Please enjoy. Thank you for coming out.